Welcome to Unit 13, Lecture 2. In Lecture 1, we talked about water resources and talked about the water that is found on the surface of the Earth. Here, we're going to go below the surface and into the ground and talk about what they call groundwater, which is water in the ground. Here we go. First of all, groundwater is the water that we cannot see most of the time because it exists underground. Alright, so yes, when we see it rain, we see water flow off the land into a river or a creek, well, a creek into a river, to lakes or oceans or, or whatever. But a lot of that water percolates or flows through the soil and down into the rocks beneath. So so think of um, coffee pot, how, how you put the water, comes up, gets put on top of the coffee grounds, and then it soaks through. Well, that's called percolation. It's a percolator. And so the groundwater does the same thing. Water moves through the soil and the rocks and the gravel and eventually gets um, stored underneath Earth's surface. And so groundwater is defined as the water beneath Earth's surface, the water in the ground. As water starts traveling below the surface into the ground, it, it reaches a level where there is a lot of water underground, where the ground is saturated or completely full of water. And this level is known as the water table. It is, it, If you're underground, it is the level where the rocks are already full of water. When it's really wet outside, it's been raining for a long time, or right in the early spring when all the snow melts, the water table could be very high, maybe even at Earth's surface, and you will see water kind of bubbling up from the ground, or you'll step into like the grass and it will be very wet, and your foot will sink in a little bit into the mud. Well, that's the water table being up near the surface. In very dry areas like deserts, the water table may be hundreds of meters or hundreds of yards below Earth's surface. And also what we see is we see the water table mirrors the shape of the land. There are peaks and valleys, and the water will flow slowly because it's going to make its way through all the rocks and everything from the peaks to the valleys and try to level itself out. But that's not a fast process because there are rocks and soil the water has to flow in. It's not just empty space the water is flowing in. The, the water is kind of trapped in the spaces between rocks and the spaces between soil molecules. Now if you have a large body of water, if you have a bunch of rocks and sediment that can store groundwater, we have what is called an aquifer. And it stores groundwater, and it also allows the flow of groundwater. And, and most of the water we use comes from aquifers. All right, the top part of the aquifer is the water table. It's the upper boundary of the aquifer, not a supper boundary, uh, upper boundary of an aquifer. And most aquifers consist of rocks and sand and gravel, and there are a lot of spaces, or pores, where the water can accumulate. And sometimes water, because of its properties of being able to dissolve a wide variety of compounds, can sometimes dissolve certain rocks, especially something like limestone. And so water can cut out caves or just huge underground areas of underground lakes where the, where the um, rocks have dissolved away. This leads to a special property of aquifers called porosity. Porosity is the total volume of rock that consists of open spaces, or pores, which are little tiny holes in in the rock and the water is stored in these pores so the more porous the more space in a rock the more water it can hold porosity leads to another um 
property called permeability, and it's the ability of rock sediment to let fluids pass through it. So not only does the rock have to have space for the water to sit, if those spaces are connected, the water can flow through those spaces. All right? Gravel will easily allow the flow of water. We call that permeable. It lets water flow through it. Clay or big chunks of a rock like granite stop water flow because there's either no pores or so little pores that the pores are not connected to each other. So if you hear somebody complaining that their soil in their backyard is all clay and it doesn't drain well, well that's because the water cannot pass through it. It is impermeable, not permeable. So the best aquifers are in permeable materials, usually sandstone, limestone, or sand and gravel, where there's enough space for the water to flow. If you are building something on your lawn, like a patio or something, they usually have you put down sand and gravel first. And what that allows for is, is easy drainage, a high permeability underneath your patio, so that if it rains, the water just doesn't sit on top of your patio. It actually goes in and soaks in from the earth around it and allows it to drain quickly. As you travel down from the surface, there are permeable layers of soil and rock, and this is how the water reaches the aquifer. It has to travel down from the surface down into the aquifer. This area where the water travels is called the recharge zone. It is the area of the ground that's usually not filled with water, but that the water has to travel through to get to the aquifer. They're very sensitive to pollution because anything that is in the recharge zone can get dissolved by the water and, and end up in the groundwater supply. And then if you're drinking from the groundwater supply, you're drinking polluted water. So it, it's very important that we keep these areas kind of pristine and, and, and safe so we're not dissolving a lot of pollutants in the water. Um, the other thing about the recharge zones is that they will filter the water. They will themselves clean the water out of stuff because some of the dissolved solids might be a little too big to pass through some of the pores. And so they will, um, the, the sand, gravel, and, and, and soil acts as like a natural filter for the water to help filter certain things out of it. Here is the picture. All right, here we have rain clouds raining on some uh, mountains. You can see streams coming down and eventually rivers heading to this lake or, excuse me, this lake or ocean right here. All right, but then if we look on the land, on the land there's an area where the water has to travel through to get underground. And so it, it recharges through this area right here until it hits the aquifer. And you can see, I'm going to draw right in red here, this little area right where the gray and the blue kind of go away from each other, that would be the water table, that upper edge of the um, the aquifer. Also in this picture there's some impermeable rock, rock that's not porous, that doesn't let water travel through, so this aquifer here is separate from the one here that also runs under the lake. And again, through there, draw the red line again, you can kind of see where the water table is. It's those red lines. That's, that's that high end of the aquifer. And as you pull water out of the aquifer, the, the water level, the um, water table could go down. So the size of the recharge zone is affected by the permeability of the surface. All right, And things like buildings and parking lots 
are designed not to let water through so they can act as impermeable layers and then they they can reduce the amount of water entering the aquifer. The like less water that's in the aquifer, the less water there's there for us to use, and there's more likely of a chance that we'll use up all that water. We have to watch out for these recharge zones to make sure that um, the water can pass through and recharge, refill the aquifer. So it can take up to thousands of years for an aquifer to be refilled. All right, it's kind of the problem we're running into out in California right now. People have used too much water that the water levels, the water tables have dropped so low, we have um, a hard time gaining access to that water because we've used more water than has been um, put into the system from rain and other natural sources. Much of the time when we want to get the groundwater out, we dig something called a well. We've been digging wells for thousands of years to get the water um, out of the ground, and we dig them because groundwater is a reliable source of water, and it's more reliable than surface water because it is filtered and purified as it goes through the recharge zone, as I talked about a couple slides ago. So it's a, it's a nice, reliable source of water, um, it exists underground, it replenishes itself with time as long as you're not taking too much out of it. The problem with wells is if you don't dig deep enough, you run the risk of the well being above the water table. So if the water table goes below the bottom of the well, the well will dry up. All right, and what this leads to is um, droughts and, and having trouble getting access to water. So we got to watch out for this situation. If we if we remove groundwater faster, then it gets refilled or recharged. And in order to keep supplying water, in this case, we have to dig the well deeper. So you just got to make sure the wells get dug deep enough so that they're into the aquifer below the water table. Um, one of the things that's best to, to drill the well originally in a drier season, like maybe the end of summer, and then you get down far enough and you go down deeper than you need to go um, at that dry season, and then during the, the more wet seasons, like early spring or spring, early summer, even late winter as the snow's melting, there's a lot more water in there, so you don't have to um, be drilled down so far, but the, the idea of drilling down is so that you don't run out of water if it gets dry. And that's really it about um, groundwater. We're going to deviate a little bit from the water resources on Earth um, and, and talk about the effects of the moon and the sun on water in the, in the third and final lecture. We're going to actually look into tides and what causes tides, and we'll tie that into the phases of the moon. And then we'll get back to, to hardcore water stuff in Unit 14, which will look at stuff like water pollution and um, ways to increase our fresh water, since, you know, there's only 3% of the water on Earth that's fresh water, and about two-thirds or more of that 3% is trapped in ice caps and glaciers, so we can't even use it. As always, if you have any questions, please bring them in, and have a good night.